All right, hello everybody. I hope you are keeping safe and sanitized. This is Bill Dorfeld, Editor-in-Chief for Nordic APIs. And I'm welcoming you to our Maturing Platform Security Livecast. In our Nordic APIs Livecasts, we bring in core community members to discuss all types of API topics. And today we're talking about how platforms can mature their security. Because as digital ecosystems mature, so much, so much, so much uh, cybersecurity. So today we feature ac experts to discuss how to evolve API security architecture with identity, especially for large platforms with externalized resources. Data breaches should be expected, and API vulnerabilities must be mitigated. So this live cast will present a ladder to security maturity, sharing need to know platform security insights like common threats facing APIs, how to use OAuth scopes and claims uh, for identity, and methods to untangle the spaghetti of trust in large interconnected ecosystems. So we like to have these live casts completely free to attend and we encourage participation. Viewers are welcome to ask questions and we will answer during the Q&As following the sessions. Today, we are featuring three API security and identity experts. We have Jacob E. Descog, VPN and identity expert at Curity. We've also got Himantru Kumar of T-Mobile and Keith Casey from Okta. We're super glad to have assembled such a great cast of experts and uh, really excited to get into things. Um, but first, just a little bit of an update from Nordic APIs. I promise to make this quick. Um, first off, the Austin API Summit was postponed due to obvious reasons. Uh, would have been actually occurring this very day, would have been our last final speaker day. But um, we plan on returning and we're still on track for Platform Summit 2020, but we'll keep everyone updated as things progress. Until then, we encourage you signing up for our newsletter. I maintain a bi-weekly API digest of some great insights from all of our writers here at Nordic APIs. And if you do so, you can also keep updated with events. Um, we also encourage people to participate in our growing community. We offer a lot of ways to do that. Um, one is speaking at webinars like the live casts, speaking at events, or uh, contributing your ideas and thought leadership to our blog. And if you'd like to do that, I'm totally willing to uh, read any sort of submission you might have. Please just email me at bill at nordicapis.com and we can work on something together. Um, we do have a rolling call for speakers that's always live. Uh, right now, we're obviously focusing on these live webinars. So if you have a cool project to share, please reach out and uh, maybe we can feature you. And yeah, like I already said, another great way to share your ideas is through the blog. We have a, a great readership and thousands of subscribers that we can reach out to and we like featuring people from the community as well. So yeah, without further ado, let's jump into things. I think that was as short as I promised, I hope. So first off, our first speaker is Jacob E. Descog, an identity specialist at Curity. Most of his time is spent working with security solutions in the API and web space. He has worked with both designing and implementing OAuth and OpenID Connect solutions for large enterprise deployments, as well as startups. And in his session today, Modernizing API Security, Jacob will describe how API security is a critical issue for modern enterprises. There is a wide spectrum of API security implementations from basic to fully evolved. To prevent vulnerabilities and reap efficiency benefits, a comprehensive identity focus is critical for fully evolved APIs. In this talk, Jacob E. Descog, identity specialist at Curity, will go through the API maturity security model and highlight the role of identity and the importance of trust. So yeah, um, as soon as you're ready, Jacob, we'd love to hear your talk. Yes, thank you. I'm gonna stop my share now. And I think you should be free to screen share. I'll give it a try.
All right. Thank you for the introduction, Bill. Um, like Bill said, Joko Bidiskog is my name. And um, OAuth and OpenID is pretty much all I work with every day. Um, aside from that, we also do a lot around authentication, which is tightly coupled to these two standards, ex except they're kind of left out of the standards um, by purpose. So at Curity, we, we build OAuth and OpenID servers and authentication mechanisms for these. Um, today, to sort of zoom in a bit on, on understanding how to modernize API security, we need to understand a, a model that we developed at Curity called the API security maturity model. Um, and it's kind of taking, taking some ideas from the REST maturity model where we can define where we are in the landscape and how to move forward. So I'm gonna drive this by example, uh, some made up, some real, uh, to sort of get the idea through here. So to understand API security maturity, we start at level zero. And this is, this is where most companies were a, a few years ago. And unfortunately, some are still here. And I'm going to explain why it's a bad idea to be at level zero, which is where you're using API keys and basic authentication for API access. So the example we're working with here is, is me, um, a user using a store, any type of online uh, web shop, let's say. So when I do that, I buy something and I'm represented as a digital snapshot of myself. So I have a, a bunch of properties. I have a name, perhaps a shirt size. Um, I'm at some place when I'm performing the, the, uh, the transaction. Um, I probably have an account ID there and, and other things may be known about me. <clears throat> so I wanna buy something. And the, the store has moved to sort of an API half-baked API infrastructure. So they're, they're moving things into microservices. Uh, so they split the inventory and the billing. So when I buy something, I need to update the billing API and I can fetch the items from the inventory and also update perhaps the stock. By level zero, the only way we can protect these APIs is we, we give access to the front end, which could be some, some web application in this case. So we can use basic, basic authentications or, or other mechanisms that are similar um, and access the API. If we need to pass some user information through, that needs to go as, alongside with the authentication mechanisms toward the API. So I can pass in the user uh, in the body, for instance. I can also pass it in the headers, obviously, which is commonly done. Gateways typically did this back in the days. They, they terminated uh, some API key and passed the header perhaps in the, with the user identifier in it, or as part of the API, uh, the URI, or in the query string, something like that. I mean, pretty much anywhere in the HTTP request. The problem though, is that what we're doing is we're verifying that one machine can talk to another machine. Uh, we didn't bind the user at all to the requested resource. So I had to pass the user information next to the authentication mechanism. And speaking of authentication, we only did authentication. We didn't do authorization here. Well, we didn't, actually, we, we didn't make it easy at least to authorize. So the API may still figure out authorization mechanisms, but we didn't help. Um, and any user information here, any properties of me is still unasserted. We just pass it on. So this became apparent and a part of it was, well, it's painful. It's basic auth is, is first of all, is shared secret. So it, it's, it's not nice to deploy and it has more problems with it than I described just here. Uh, so people started moving towards token-based authentication, which is OAuth essentially you use an access token to access something. And this is level one of the security maturity model. We're moving up the ladder. So we introduce an OWASP server in the equation here. And still, we're gonna do the same transaction. So I'm gonna buy something. But now, we're gonna make it a bit more advanced. Uh, the store is implementing a back office service. So they also will work with these APIs and update the APIs. Um, new 
new things to sell show up. So they want to update the inventory. Um, they want to do booking, uh, do the books in the end of the year and access the billing API, all of these kind of things that are back office related. There's no sense in having different APIs for it. So, I mean, if we have a billing API, that's the place to go and find stuff about billing. Uh, same with inventory. So the back office is using the same API infrastructure as the front end shop. So they both will use the OWA server, get access tokens and do requests against the APIs. These are called bearer tokens. They're still sent in the authorization header, pretty much like basic auth, uh, except now in order to obtain one, a user had to authenticate. So an OWASP flow or most OWASP flows involve the user somehow to authenticate and grant the access. So now we moved one step up. Like I said before, basic auth only authenticated the machine. Now we actually made the user part of the authentication mechanism. So we not only know that the client can make the call, we also know that the user is part of that. We still only answer the question who you are though. We didn't really help answering anything about what you're allowed to do. And as you saw here, the same API was used for different types of access. So we need, of course, to help the API to not have to do very custom logic to figure these things out. Um, who is accessing it and how would it do that based on this? Well, it had to go and look up things in various places and then make decisions based on that if you should be able to update the inventory or just list the inventory. But let's see a few things. First of all, we had two different applications and we wanna separate the concern here. We wanna make sure that one application can at least only do one thing and the other can only do another thing. And that brings us to token-based authorization, which is level two here of the maturity model. The way OWASP, made possible to do this was using something called an OAuth scope. Most of you probably know what this is. Um, a good way to think of it is scope of access. So when a client requests a token, it can also, it can require, request a bunch of scope tokens, they're called, and the authorization server will determine if that client is allowed to get those and then issue that in the tokens. The scope themselves are just a, a space separated string. So name the permission in a space separated string. So they don't really have any values or anything like that. They're just names. Um, so let's invent some scopes for this example. We could take the inventory API and we could take the billing API. Inventory, let's say we can read and write. So we create the inventory read and inventory write, naive scopes. And for billing, we can do the same thing, but here maybe we want some more uh, details so we can do billing read. We can perhaps create single item and update to, to update anything in the billing API. And then we assign these to the various applications. So the www application in the front end, it can only access things via the inventory read and billing create single scope. Whereas the back office can do billing read, update and inventory write. So it has more power, if you will. So as they request tokens from the OWASP server, these scopes will be now embedded in the token. Um, so the access token coming to the www client here will contain billing create single and inventory read, contra to the access token two here, which has more power. Um, this is slightly better, of course. We can now lock down the application so we can make sure that it's not enough to just get onto the network, get it, find an access token in a log or something and do anything. We, we can help the API much better to say, well, when you get a token, just look at the, open the token, look at the scope string, see, you know, what does it say? And then make, build some authorization logic around that. It's very clean, very simple. Uh, everybody can understand how to do that. Um, easy to do right, if you will. Um, scopes, however, are typically application bound. They're not bound to the user. So that means the, the way scopes were designed, essentially, you can think of Facebook is when you, when you log into another site and you use Facebook to log in, you usually get prompted with, do you want this application to be able to you know, post on your wall? or whatever you do these days. 
um, that is scope. That's a, that's a consent to allowing that application to do things on your behalf. So the Facebook had an application or a client configured, which was allowed to do certain thing, given that the user um, allowed that. Uh, you don't have to involve the user in these things, but it's application layer. So it doesn't really say anything about who the logged in or what the logged in user is, is allowed to do here. So having invoice read here or um, sorry, inventory read, what does that mean? What inventories can I read? Billing, right, Bingles, billing single update. What, what billing can I update? Anything or and to illustrate this, I'm gonna give you another example, which is uh, a Swedish application that probably wasn't using OAuth, but I'm gonna pretend it did because it makes a lot of sense. Even if they did, they'd have this problem. Uh, this is a payment application, user to user payment. You could log into this, uh, the user logged in and we used, or they used the Swedish EID to log in. So they, the OAuth server, if they had one, would open the bank ID application uh, which is the national EID here in Sweden, and the user would authenticate, which is a strong authentication. Bank ID would then return and say, yes, we have asserted this user, and the user would be logged in, and perhaps they would get an access token. With this, they'd have something called list transactions, probably. List transactions means I can see what payments I've received and paid lately. And then I can make a call to the Swish API from the app and say, hey, give me my payment history. The Swish app was based on phone numbers. So it wasn't really based on the social security number or anything that Bank ID provided. It was based on phone numbers, so I could easily pay to someone else's phone. So payment history slash phone number slash all would give you all the transactions for that phone number. So turns out if you replace that phone number with another phone number, you would get that, those transactions instead. So the scope here, list transactions, didn't help at all. And this is interesting because it means that we usually have an unintended chain of trust. We have an application calling some gateway that calls an API that perhaps calls another API and so on. And in the middle of that, one of the APIs say, oh, in order to call the next one, I need to add stuff to the request. Um, so I'll add phone number in here and make the next call. So then all of a sudden, one of the APIs trusts the information that came in the middle. Um, let me see what I got here. Uh, I'll answer some questions in the end here. Um, so we trusted stuff that was not necessarily asserted by the one we thought it was. And that obviously introduces these types of problems. What if the one adding information does the wrong thing? And that brings us to the final layer here, level three, centralized trust using claims. So a claim is a structure like this. It's a subject, an attribute, and someone who issues it or asserts it. So Jacob works at Curity, says Travis. If you trust Travis, you can trust that I work at Curity. That's a claim. So it's a property about a subject asserted by a party. And this is how OAuth tokens work. So if we introduce claims into this scenario, so when I wanna buy something here and I'm logged in, instead of just saying, okay, this billing create single scope and inventory read scope is there, we can now also embed stuff like the account ID, I'm a user type customer, I have a shirt type 48 and so on. Whereas the internal token can contain other claims like row list or admin, and that wasn't part of the external access token. So now the OWASP server looks up details about the identity and adds it inside the token. And it looks simple and it is pretty simple when you think about it, but it has a huge security impact because now we trust a single source. So claims, they can be centrally managed we then as APIs, we know if it's inside the token, someone in the middle didn't just add stuff to this. Um, authorization becomes a lot more uniform and reliable. We can now just crack open the token and check, okay, I, in order to do this update of an invoice, I need to see the role store admin. Um, if it's not there, it's not there. So code is simple to implement based on this. So we can reduce attack vectors. We can even reduce attack vectors or mistake vectors, if you will, um, 
even though you can't do harm, you could still screw up things uh, easily when you add properties on the way. This can be removed. And this is essentially the place you want to get to in order to mature your API security model. Thank you. Any okay, questions yeah. there? Yeah, thank you, Jacob. Um, it looks like we're getting some questions coming in, but uh, first, yeah, I just wanted to say awesome overview of why APIs need to mature their security and the levels of progress that you've outlined. Um, we've covered this on a, a couple times on the blog. I, I think having a maturity model is super interesting um, because we've seen the maturity models exist for other things like the API design maturity model with Richardson, but having one that's like dedicated to security uh, could help a lot of people see the, the bigger picture. Um, so why did you create the security model in your own words? Like, was it inspired by your, your work and working with clients and seeing kind of where they are in practice? Yeah. Uh, one thing we learned early on uh, in security uh, was that you need, you need a way to map existing landscapes onto where you want to go. Uh, we, we early on had a, an, an architecture model we called the Neo security architecture, which was essentially like, what logical components do you need in your network in order to perform uh, identity in a scalable, structured, easy to understand way? Uh, the architecture was really just there to sort of help people map what do I have and where should we go and how do we get there? So, I mean, the maturity model is, is, is kind of a evolution of that as well. Like, we need to understand, like, there's a ladder and, and I'm climbing this mountain and where are we on it? So, yeah, it's, it's really just that type of tool um, to, to map you in and, and also explain why, why should you go to... Yeah. another level i mean yeah yeah where do you see most companies currently existing along the spectrum uh level one and two for sure i mean we don't see a whole lot of level zero of api keys and and basic auth anymore uh luckily uh, uh, of yeah exactly but but i i think a lot of people are, are at adding scope based control now um but there are a lot of inherent like not flaws, but but um, shortcomings, I should say, to that mm -hmm. practice. It's I, I would say you're not you're not there until you have full utilization of, of claims in your identity infrastructure. Uh, we usually talk, like you mentioned in the beginning, of spaghetti of trust. Like you mm -hmm. you don't really know what you trust until you sort of map it out. And it turns out it's really hard to map it out when you don't have a few points of trust. So using a token-based architecture like that with claims is really the way to sort of get a full picture of that. And it's an old problem. I mean, SAML had the same things. I mean, that, that's, that's where you usually talked about spaghetti of trust because you would have like an end, end point on a, on a WAM, web application uh, management. No, what's it called? Yeah, never mind. Uh, which would federate away to somewhere and then you would come back there and into your application. And, and that was on the side sometimes and you didn't even know like that was there. So a secured architect on the other side of the network had no idea that like, if you get through all the way there, you can actually jump to another site and be logged in, but it's not centrally managed. Um, and and, and we, we have the same problems, I would say, uh, here. Yep. Um, so we'll get to the other panelists, but uh, real quick, we had one question from uh, Levon. Levon says, hello, is there a point of using mutual TLS instead of using app key slash secret key pair for client identification? And which one is more secure? PS, and considering their transport is HTTPS, so it is secure. Sure, yeah, I mean, sure, of course. Mutual TLS is nice because it's asymmetric keys used to set up the, the tunnel. Uh, so in that sense, it, it's better than basic auth. Uh, what you should do if you want to take it into this model is you should use mutual TLS together with something called sender constraint tokens. So you, you also bind the access token to the private key of the, of the mutual TLS. Uh, channel. So once the token is issued to a client, you have to use the same private key to set up the mutual TLS channel against the API as you use to get the token from the OWL server. Then you can't act, nobody can steal that token then and use it because they also have to steal your private key for your mutual TLS tunnel. So 
that there's a good article on that on our website. I recommend to read also mutual to less. Yeah, we'll try to link to more resources uh, once we post the video as well. Um, speaking of which, I think Curity has a great resource developed for discovering OAuth flows that you recently made last year, right? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're working hard on that, adding articles every week, trying to sort of capture the, the general stuff also, not only Curity specific things. All right, well, let's move on for now. Um, I think we can come back to some of those topics in future Q and A's. But uh, next up, our second speaker is Himanshu Kumar of T-Mobile. Himanshu Kumar has been focused on service design and governance space for more than a decade. While technology paradigms have transitioned from SOA and ESB to API management, architectural patterns have changed from reusable services to nimble RESTful APIs and microservices. Some challenges have remained unsolved though. API security is where the focus needs to be and this is where Himanshu spends most of his energy in solving it at a scale. So I'll stop my share there and uh, yeah, welcome you to the live cast. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, feel free to share your screens. Excellent. Hey, thanks Bill for introduction. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Um, so, um, so yeah, I hope uh, you guys are doing well. Uh, tough times uh, in the world, uh, so um, stay safe. And thanks for engaging with us today. So um, OAuth and scope, um, what Jacob was talking about, I think my, uh, uh, my uh, talk really builds upon that in a way. Um, um, as an introduction to me, uh, who I am, I'm Himanshu Kumar, uh, working at T-Mobile in uh, API security and design for past 14 years. And uh, challenges that we see at an enterprise scale uh, our team tries to solve it um, using the general security practices, uh, OAuth and OpenID Connect, but also done advances to make those reusable and share to community in these uh, security libraries that we have. Um, as uh, um, Jacob was talking about in terms of how scope and uh, binded token um, Builds the gives you the highest mature maturity level security. Um, now we need to uh, see how we can practically leverage those. Um, so today uh, we have a problem with controlling the access to uh, to the API endpoint in a federated manner. And what I mean by that is we don't have to go to uh, the authorization server or the centralized point from where you can check whether some token is valid or not. So how can we do the federated endpoint security? Um, but uh, wasn't OAuth supposed to solve that for us? So this is a typical OAuth flow uh, where you have the resource owner who is granting the authorization to allow application to access their uh, resources via APIs by uh, binding the, uh, granting the scopes that gets binded to the token. So um, that should work, right? But uh, not so much in a very complex, or, uh, complex organization where you have large set of resources. Um, so initially, uh, as you would have experienced in your application security, we had access token, which are just opaque strings. Um, uh, so not much meaning you can drive, uh, derive out of that and anyone that can get to it can uh, exploit that. Now from that, we moved on to uh, JWT tokens uh, for access and ID tokens uh, and which when you can expand, you will see uh, you can get more meaningful data out of that, including scopes. So we already have the ability to encode scopes inside a federated JAK token. Um, uh, that gets us advanced, but uh, as we will see, 
it doesn't solve all the cases that you would find in a practical uh, complex enterprise environment. So coming back to scope itself as uh, scope, uh, as you would be aware of scopes from OAuth definitions, uh, it is the authorization and token endpoints when, uh, when users are doing the OAuth three-legged OAuth dance uh, that allows the client to specify what is the scope they want to, uh, uh, they want the authorization server to assert for the, uh, in the token that can be used by the resource server to allow access to the APIs. So scopes are defined and governed on authorization server captured during the OAuth consent flow, and it is to be used by resource server. But uh, there are still problems uh, that I uh, set out at the beginning. If you look at uh, some sample examples, you would see uh, typically you would be presented with a screen like this, where you are using the auth server uh, uh, during initial user auth authentication. They are presented with a list of uh, scopes, uh, which are uh, kind of a more user-friendly manner this is the description you are seeing, see, the user sees, and underlying you would see uh, like a string that will say profile is the scope and email address is the scope. But uh, when you're building a large application like uh, or a website, which relies on hundreds and thousands of APIs, uh, we can't typically have user go through all the, uh, like a large list of resources um, and uh, scopes that are representing them uh, for user experience reasons. So uh, scopes don't solve capturing the application and client level uh, access needs uh, uh, like a kind of selected by user. And uh, even if uh, we, whichever scope we capture in the token, let's say profile or email address, uh, they cannot be universally interpreted across all resource server. If you have multiple domains, uh, those meaning of that value, scope value, be it profile or email address, isn't uh, like a, you cannot derive the same access uh, intent in across the domain. And we'll highlight more about why that is. So once you can't have that, even if those things are encoded in the token, you can do the federated endpoint authorization. So how we go about it? We'll, we'll take a quick look at uh, what, uh, what role we want to assign inside the tokens, uh, access and ID tokens, uh, which are the open ID connect uh, concepts for uh, ID token especially how we manage the cascaded, cascading dependency across the uh, resources. So I gave initial example where you have hundreds of APIs and resources. We don't want to, and then under, underneath uh, each of those API implementation, it might be calling additional APIs and that may be calling additional APIs. So there is a dependency chain. So you can't always resolve all dependency chain across uh, your uh, enterprise API implementation before you encode all those scopes back into the token. So how do we manage the cascading scope dependency if we are encoding the scope inside the token? Uh, by encoding, I mean attaching the scope inside the token. So what's the defin defin definition and governance approach we can take to achieve that. And uh, I present one use case of how we do it. And uh, then we can, uh, there are optimization ideas to make it work for your environment. So this is how we'll approach um, uh, practical handling of scope in a large enterprise environment. So um, this is a typical API stack, right? Um, where you have users accessing an application and then granting, uh, verifying their identity using authorization server. It can be your own internal enterprise authorization server. Typically, if you uh, are a large enterprise, users' uh, credentials and profiles either 
uh, are typically your own um, authorization server. You're not going to Google or Facebook to verify your user's identity. Uh, that, that can also be the case, but all I'm saying is uh, uh, typically you have a, a user identity server which issues you access an ID token, and then that allows your application to make API calls. And uh, these API calls are implemented, uh, typical architecture, you will have API gateway and then services layer. Um, but um, these, these endpoints, so typically you see one API will have a gateway endpoint and your services endpoint. So let's say those two. But dependency will, um, so dependency tree and chain is all still there. Like while implementing that API, you may need to call other APIs to be able to achieve the functionality. So that's the API stack. Um, how do we use a token uh, with embedded scope in this environment? So uh, we want to use the, uh, all the scopes to, whichever endpoints we want to control access using scope, we need to define the scope that's pretty much given that represent that endpoints um, uh, kind of a functionality, right? That uniquely you are able to identify that if you see a string that says order domains, order resource, then um, you know that it is talking about uh, your endpoint point and not any other endpoint. So you can, if you see that scope in the token, then you can pretty much uh, make your decision whether to allow or deny access to your, that endpoint. So all the, all such scope that, uh, all such endpoints that need to be governed and uh, access control should define the scope. Um, scope should represent not only the users, uh, uh, the, the logical things that you saw users uh, granted uh, consent on. And in many cases in enterprise environment, if you are your own uh, authorization provider, authorization server provider, you don't even have the interaction with the user to have them uh, basically choose, uh, authorize the uh, scope because user understands that they are accessing the application uh, and they are accessing the data. So you don't have user interaction uh, per se. So, but if you do uh, take into account the user granted scope, uh, but also on your API control layer, API gateway or any other layer where you're managing your applications uh, API endpoint access, those endpoint access also represented as scope. Uh, you take a union of all that and if, either user or application is requesting specific scope, then you look at what you're allowing versus what they requested and uh, uh, do the intersection of that and uh, bind the resulting scopes in the token. If you do it, uh, if you collect the scopes in the token this way, then essentially that federated token can be used at any endpoint uh, to enable the access control in a zero trust manner. So um, we have a concept of access token, which are uh, controlling the applications or users access to APIs. And then we have identity token, which is um, what uh, Jacob was uh, talking about users claims about uh, whether their age or profile or any other information that you want to provide those information is Presented, uh, ca captured inside identity token. And both are uh, JSON web tokens. So once you, and digitally signed and verifiable at any layer. So once you have these two types of token, then you can use your access token to control your endpoint authorization and identity token to do finer grained user uh, level data authorization. So going into the cascading or uh, API dependency chain resolution. Um, so this will be a typical um, API, uh, like a implementation domains, um, uh, uh, domain one or domain two, you may have resources that are defined like inventory or orders or customer 
there are typical resources which uh, would have presence in multiple domains. So as you can see here, resource one or functional resources, uh, resource one and function uh, uh, two uh, reoccur in other domain also, but they are different API endpoints. Um, and uh, they have unique uh, functions and resources specific to those uh, their own domain also. So in a bounded context uh, domain implementation, you um, may still have uh, resources and functions that are ambiguous, which is why I was saying that uh, interpreting the scope as consented by user may not be unique enough. Um, so if they're consenting to, let's say, profile or uh, uh, billing resources, if those resources happen to be present in domain one versus domain two, uh, we may have a challenge. And if we want to control access to only one of those uh, to the user or to the application, then uh, that's why this uh, uh, simple definition doesn't work. But uh, as far as the dependency itself, um, domain one while implementing resource two may need to make an API call into domain two um, to aggregate some data. And uh, while doing that, there is a dependency. So, um, and this resource uh, three being called by resource two um, would, uh, would have a different uh, like a scope under which it operates obviously. So um, when we are writing that, when we are issuing that token to client, um, if we have to encode all the scopes across all the domains, that will be uh, not a scalable model. So uh, what do we encode inside the token? When we have thousands of API endpoints and hundreds of domains, and we have cross domain dependency, right? So how do we approach that? Um, so the way we suggest to approach that is basically scoping uh, each API, each uh, like basically staying in the domain boundary. So as you can see here, uh, the endpoint application that is calling uh, APIs, uh, all the endpoints that uh, this application needs access to at the gateway, those immediate domain endpoints are encoded as a scope inside the token issued to this application. But when a recipient endpoint needs to make the dependent API call, they are requesting a new access token that are spec that are issued to the identity of uh, domain one uh, and not to the identity of this application. So, um, so this application gets a token which has all the uh, API uh, scopes that are that is needed uh, by it immediately. But any dependent scopes are abstracted away from uh, this application's purview because they don't, this application doesn't care if uh, there are some resources needed in domain two for its API to work. That is managed by this, app, this domain one. Whenever it needs to cross the domain boundary, then it needs to get a new access token. Um, this is the uh, T-Mobile API application uh, access protocol TAP is what we have. Uh, we are implementing in a zero trust model across all domains. And uh, here you'll see uh, access token and ID token I have already talked about, which is the ID token being identity of user and all the user specific claims being there. And uh, proof of possession token is what binds or signs the application, um, applications, uh, each request uh, with their private key. So I think that that aspect is achieved uh, for transactional integrity and token theft uh, mitigation. So if we have application like one layer concern encoded inside the token uh, and uh, across the domain access 
being managed by issuing a new token, then we can have a federated security using the uh, scope. But how do we define and govern that? So you, you could have seen, uh, there are many examples of how scope should be defined. Uh, it could be as verbose as what Google has or as simple as what GitHub has. But uh, um, again, for uniqueness sake, uh, we are recommending that you have at least three, no, three segments, uh, domain, resource, and action. Uh, some examples like this uh, you can uh, arrive at. And if you have some resources or any segment that you are giving access to all resources, that can, then you can come up with a pattern of whitelisting. And also you can govern action values. Um, in some cases, if you want to go domain uh, to be much more um, resilient, to be able to represent cross organization boundary, then you can prefix uh, uh, your organization like URN pattern. Uh, but you can manage that uh, with the domain name. You can uh, like kind of hide away that complexity inside the domain name. Um, a typical management of uh, and definition and management of scope would uh, look like this, where you have the API consumer governance, and then you have the API product team. So by product and domain are these are the uh, like a, this is the group which is defining and creating the APIs. And uh, this is more who is managing the access control and being the interface between your consumer applications and partners um, who are managing the access grant to your APIs. So you have a the entity of which defines the clients, all the scopes that that client is requesting. These scope uh, requests go to the API product owners who review and approve and be aware of at least that uh, there are certain API uh, clients of certain architecture patterns um, that are um, going to be calling that API uh, that drives the data authorization needs if it is a uh, user level access. Uh, if the user is present at the end of the application, then data authorization using ID token becomes a paramount significance uh, in that case. And while they define the APIs, they also choose the domain in which they are defining the API. Uh, what are the scopes those APIs uh, support or uh, uh, need? And each of the APIs in those resources. So this is a like a basic set of uh, scopes for their domain. And these are the applicable scopes for a given API endpoint. And then this is scope dependency. So uh, I talked about this earlier that cross domain dependency is taken care by uh, requesting a new access token. Uh, but within a domain dependency, the domain team uh, defines like if uh, within the same domain, if API endpoint one needs to call uh, another microservice endpoint two, then what are, and if that microservice endpoint two happens to be operating under a different scope value, then what are such values? So that we declare the uh, dependent scope within domain. And these two uh, entity essentially gives you like a list of all scopes for a given client. So if you know the client ID, then you can essentially see what all scopes should be applicable for that client. Um, this is a kind of a next entity view of that, what kind of attributes you can have in those entities and how it relates. I'm not going to go into uh, much detail here, but I think this is pretty self-explanatory. Mostly the IDs um, of these entities and the key properties of that, key attributes of those entities like uh, relationships. Um, so clients, uh, for a given client ID is C123 in an environment dev, if he has requested scope one and three, and a domain CRM uh, has 
um, scopes defined for order read and there is a api order uh, like a crm get v1 orders api which which allows its uh, access if someone has scoped s1 as uh, up to like it can allow multiple scopes uh, and this is dependent on api s2 or scope 2 uh, then essentially what it means is even if uh, th so this client uh, can request if they have requested access to s1 then essentially they also need s2 in it uh, as a scope because s1 depends on s2 um, so so essentially we are resolving these scopes by a given client and environment that um, for allowing client c123 in a dev environment the token must have uh, these three scopes and this will get automatically resolved if this definition and governance protocol is followed. So how do we further optimize it? Like how, how, the, how does the token issuance happens really quick? Um, so it follows the typical OAuth pattern where a token request comes from the application, a user logs in and authorizes the scope and uh, uh, they get the auth code. And when the auth code is being exchanged, this is the step five where I'm um, suggesting that uh, the authorization server makes the call to this scope registry that I uh, talked about earlier uh, in the previous slide. And for a given client ID, it will get the these dependent scopes um, that has been resolved and that will get encoded inside the token. And once these tokens are presented to API gateway or uh, the domain API microservice layer, they can use the scope to do the data authorization. And this all happens in a federated zero trust. And uh, once they cross the domain boundary, they will obviously get a new access token and applicable scope will get again uh, attached within that token. So, um, so this is a very basic, uh, like a access uh, uh, flow pattern but uh, what can we do uh, is part of further optimization so you can automate the scope ingestion inside the scope registry by processing the swaggers uh, you still would need uh, uh, ability to modify that or add additional ones where the swaggers uh, some apis which don't have swaggers so those cases would apply so you can automate as much as you can on domain and scope ingestion, but have to have ability to modify it as needed. Now, this is one big problem that we see where if you see um, a scope string like this, uh, for, a, for a big uh, application, for a kind of complex application, which provides a lot of functionality, you would end up like hundreds and hundreds of uh, scopes that apply to uh, that API, uh, that client. Um, so you can imagine if like 500 such strings uh, of 25 or 50 characters are uh, to be needed inside a token, uh, then it can be a large token. Uh, but the other ideas to do that, uh, optimize that is what we have tried is a bit encoding where uh, you can represent each of the scope uh, on a given position to represent by zero or one. Um, so, um, so that reduces your token size uh, from a very large token to a manageable size token and uh, some pattern is listed here. And then there is a library that uh, the recipient microservice or uh, endpoint can locally uh, interpret these and don't have to go back to authorization server. So this, uh, this uh, I think, uh, can help immensely in that token size management. Additional ideas, uh, you, if you uh, don't have ability to uh, have your identity provider talk to um, the scope registry during token creation, then, and you can't embed the scope inside the token, then additional way could be for your microservice uh, to 
call the introspect endpoint and uh, get the applicable scope for that access token um, where they can retrieve and cache it uh, locally uh, for a given client ID and optimization uh, or translation you can still do for user defined scope to uh, the domain specific scope. Um, so I think we talked about scope uh, white listing. Like if you have, uh, if you don't do the bit encoding, you can still optimize the size by uh, like looking for if let's say most of the opportunity stay uh, is found uh, if you have uh, API consumer, which essentially consumes almost all of your uh, domain resources, then you can whitelist the resource part to star or if uh, they operate on multiple actions or all the actions that are uh, defined then again that segment can be um, like this segments can become star if uh, all that is applicable for a given scenario um, now if you define the scopes uh, in the scope registry you have a opportunity to group these scopes and uh, create another logical abstraction, higher level abstraction, which is called API product, where you can assign product to a client and that assignment translates uh, the underlying scopes. And uh, if you have a access token, which includes all this scope inside, then essentially you can use that uh, to do in a, federated manner, like any point where you have that token in the request, you can uh, like you can configure that, okay, I have API endpoint one in service mesh or any application that is uh, um, having that API endpoint controller, that if I am presented with a token with scopes X, Y, and Z, then only I allow access to myself. So that mm -hmm. config configuration mm -hmm. you can have and uh, that will um, and token presented can uh, basically uh, operate together. All right. Um, can you hear me? Am I coming through? Yes. All right, great. Thank you, Humanshu. Uh, I think that was a great overview of a practical design approach on how to assign scopes throughout many domains and cross organizational boundaries. And as you say, you know, uh, once we're scaling in these huge enterprise environments, um, really optimizing and slimming how scopes are handled uh, has clear efficiency benefits. Um, we got to move on to our final presentation. I'm sorry to kind of cut things short with Q&A right now, but I'm not seeing any questions. So uh, I think we're just going to jump right in. Um, let's bring you back in for the final Q&A after um, our closer here. Um, Always excited to view uh, Keith Casey. Uh, let's make sure that he's ready to go. Yeah, I'm good to go. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Can hear you great. Fantastic. Um, All right. Uh, hello. Welcome, everybody. I'm Keith Casey. Uh, I work at Okta uh, doing single sign-on identity management, API access management. I did want to say thanks to Bill and crew. I know you guys are supposed to be here with me in Austin. Uh, let's, let's do this next year. So that uh, I, I live and breathe a loss and like there are customer problems at Okta. So uh, I, I deeply appreciate the work that Jacob and crew have done with that. Um, and it's, it's fascinating to see like different people's takes on this. But I've been working in APIs now for about 15 years. I was early at a little company at the time called Twilio, interviewed when there were 15 people. We all fit around one conference table. Um, I also wrote the book on API design. and. Uh, this is literally the URL, the API design book.com. It's not yet another or some API design book. It is the, uh, but fundamentally what I'm here to talk about today is security. So if you're familiar with the API evangelist, my favorite guy in the world, Ken Lane, uh, he really has a kind of a twisted, but accurate view of me of like, once we, once we have this data, once we have the APIs that we can connect them together, like what can we do with it? So I always try to look at the angles of, uh, how can something be attacked? How can it be misused? How can it be abused? Uh, and how can we have fun? I mean, how can we make sure things are secure across the board? So I always look at the world as that there's five points to attack. Uh, one is the user and having a single sign on identity provider and stuff mitigates some of that. Number two is the communication channels themselves. HTTPS, 
takes care of a lot of that. Three is the, the gateway, four is the API, and five are the other systems that are, de that are uh, fulfilling the dependencies of your API and your systems. Um, Jacob talked great about one and two. Uh, Hermanshu talked a, a little bit about the scopes and how that all works together. I'm going to focus on three and four because the way most APIs come out is it's very rare that it's a, a senior level, like senior employee level leadership decision. Uh, usually by the time it gets that point, a lot of things have occurred. So the way I look at the world and the way the vast majority of our customers have like designed and built APIs is that we end up with these four phases and we start from phase zero because we're software developers and we always count from zero. Um, but the vast majority of APIs start from an internal effort. It's this team team has built the same thing three, four, five, a dozen times. And now they're trying to figure out uh, how do we scale this? They get, they get tired of, of trying to do the same thing over and over again. So they build out an API just to make their own lives easier. And eventually some other team down the hall hears about it and they say, wow, that API solves the exact problem that we had, the exact problem we're struggling with. Can we use it? And so we end up with switching from five people to five teams. And we end up with more and more people using our API, which is great. This is what we want. We want more people using our software, reduces uh, or it increases reuse, reduces complexity, you know, all those, all those good metrics and ideas to keep our, uh, our mind on. Next up though, a shift happens because somebody in the organization realizes that that use case from that team down the hall, that looks a lot like a partner use case. In fact, we have customer suppliers, maybe top tier customers that are all thinking along the same lines. And so we switch from just opening this up to teams down the hall, to teams outside our organization. And something different happens there. Generally, this is a more senior level um, VP sort of director of something organ at the organization driving this. But we start changing our thinking around APIs. Now, we still have all the constraints and limitations and problems that we had at phase zero, but this is, this is growing exponentially at this point. And at some point, some point we have this radical shift where a lot of organizations realize that API is a core fundamental piece of their approach and they need to stop and think about things differently. And this is when things get interesting because at this point, the security team gets a heads up and they realize, oh, wait a minute, we have this API and this API is being made available to uh, external third parties and, and things like that. And so usually at this point, somebody asks the security team to stop and reevaluate it. Here's the danger. At phase zero, we had five people. At phase one, we had five teams. At phase two, we had five organizations. In phase three, we have the whole world. But any vulnerability that's discovered right here, right now by the security team existed the whole time. It just when everyone that was using our API, we could, we could name or we can name their teams. We didn't have the same security considerations. And fundamentally, we should. We should realize that as our APIs are successful, they're going to grow in adoption. They're going to grow in usage. And if we don't take these concerns seriously early on, we're causing catastrophic problems later. Because if we get to phase three and we realize um, we don't have scopes in our API, which still happens, uh, we need to stop and rethink that. In fact, we have to go back and reintegrate our API with, with all those applications. If somebody used API keys instead of OAuth, we have to stop and reintegrate that with all those applications. So how do we do this? How do we make sure that our API is secure before we get to phase three? And I have a really simple idea. We need to attack. We need to attack our APIs. We need to act like the bad guy. We need to stop and think about how can we, how can we misuse and abuse our API in, in creative ways? Because let's be honest, we know somebody's going to do it. When you get feedback, when you get that critical feedback on your job performance or, or uh, on your relationship, whatever, do you want it to come from somebody that you trust, that you admire, that you respect, or do you want it to come from ra some random internet stranger? Hopefully we want this to come from people we respect. So let's attack our API with the people that we trust, the people that we know aren't going to, to misuse and abuse the resulting information. So I, I kind of break this down into about three layers. Uh, first one is authentication authorization. We need to test our API keys. Uh, I was playing with an API recently and I found the average or the API key length was eight characters. 
it wasn't MD5 characters, just a hex code, but it was eight characters, all alphanumeric. How long does it take to breach or to generate a list of valid API keys? Probably not very long. We need to think about if we're using API keys, how are we securing these? How are we making sure that they're big, they're, they're long enough that people can't collide into other ones and misuse an, a, an API under somebody else's account? Then we need to test our scopes. We need to think about how are our scopes being used? Are they actually reflective of the permissions that they grant? So having scopes named well, having scopes actually tied down and limited to what they're supposed to do is great. But we need to think one level above that too. And we need to get, we need to fuzz our scopes. And the exclamation point there is not, is factorial, not just for emphasis. We need to think about, are there particular combinations of scopes that if we include them together, end up with a bad result, end up with a bad set of permissions that we didn't expect. It's fascinating to, when you dig into security vulnerabilities, how many of them come because there are mismatches between systems. There's an impedance mismatch where information from one is not translated securely or reasonably over to another. And we end up with granting a little more information or a little more access than we thought. So once we're in the API, we need to take another step and we need to attack our endpoints. My favorite thing is always use garbage data. And I don't mean garbage data like, well, this expects an integer, let's give it a, um, a alphanumeric or an alphabetical character. I mean, use garbage data like if this API accepts, if you're a banking API and you accept pictures of checks so people can do mobile deposit, try to feed it a 500 meg wave file. See what happens. If your system takes that, if your system processes that, if your system just gets tied up while it's analyzing that, that may be an angle for attack. Now, still switch things around, still play with characters, try to make negative deposits, things like that. Still play with things, but play within creative ways. Play within ways of your APIs under attack. Make sure you can you tear these things apart the right way. Next, I always say explore your endpoints with the uh, adoption of the open API spec and uh, hypermedia in general. More and more of our payloads are giving those other endpoints. That's fantastic. Let's try them. Let's see what else is there. In fact, let's generate random ones and see what happens. Are there secret endpoints in your API that you're not exposing or documenting to the world? Here's, here's the thing. Even if you're not exposing, even if you're not documenting them, just making them in your API means you have exposed them to the world. Take those into account. Play with them. See what, what ones people can discover by accident. And then try every verb. Everyone thinks about, oh, well, you know, Git put post to lead, and that's a pretty good set of options. Well, there was a great vulnerability, I believe it was with GitHub last year, where if you could try the options verb, that generated a different result and allowed you to get access to things that you weren't expecting. That's bad. We need to try these things because somebody else will. And then once we get past the endpoints, we need to dig into the data itself. And so I always say, uh, have fun with the payloads. Increment the IDs. Now, most people have heard about the Equifax hack at this point. What most people don't realize is that they, the attackers use the infamous hacker method of adding one. So they got access to a valid account, you know, ID one, two, three, four, five. And then they added one to get to the next one. Increment these ideas, decrement these ideas if you really want to get wild. Play with them, see what you can do, see which ones are discoverable. You may not necessarily, uh, get access to something, but the error messages you get might be super informative. If somebody gives you back a 404, we know it's not found. Okay, that, that's great. That doesn't tell us information. That doesn't tell us whether or not it exists. If, if I try to access Jacob's bank account and I get back a 401, your API just told me, oh, wait a minute, you're not authorized for that, but it exists. These are the kind of things that our error messages can leak information. So in that case, maybe we switch to a 404 to be able to say, nope, that doesn't exist. Because as far as my world is concerned, it doesn't. And once again, we need to try every verb. When we feed data to our API, we mess around with the play payloads. Let's cr create bigger, ugly, complex payloads and start having fun with them. Let let's try not to just post them. Let let's do a put, see what happens. The absolute worst case that happens is nothing happens. And that's a good place to be. 
So when we attack our APIs, I really want to break things down into these three levels. Let's attack, let's attack the front gate. Let's attack the authentication authorization to see what we can get at. Then let's, let's rattle the doorknobs. Let's look at the endpoints and see what we can do. And then let's attack the payloads. If we can get into the actual data and see what we can do, we can cause all kinds of problems. Now, there's another point that I haven't actually talked about here. If you do this well, your alarm system should be going wild. If you don't have monitoring in place, you're setting yourself up for a catastrophic situation. Your monitoring systems should set off every alarm you have. It should send the bat signal out. It should send every single thing out to make sure that everyone who needs to know that something is happening actually knows. And in fact, uh, T-Mobile has a great example of this one. In August, uh, I believe it was 2018, they had a breach and uh, somebody started downloading all their customer data. Well, the, the cybersecurity, their team there realized it. And they're able to hit that big red button to shut down the API within minutes. Now, some customer data was still stolen. I think it was six or 7% of the overall system, or maybe I was upwards of 10%. Regardless, it wasn't 100%. That's a better place to be. Would we have loved to stop the breach entirely? Yes, absolutely. But being able to stop it in progress is just as important. This is why we have fire alarms in buildings. We can't stop everything. But if, when something happens, if something happens, being able to respond effectively and shut it down is just as important. So that, that's Keith Casey, or that, that's me, I'm Keith Casey, amazingly enough. And that's sort of an adversarial approach. Like how do, we, how do we be the bad guy against our own APIs and think about how is somebody going to misuse it? Because you know what, somebody will. We just need to accept that and realize it. Let's make sure it's us. With that, I'll hand it back to Bill. Thank you. Awesome. Keith, always love your presentations. I think this must be your fourth or fifth with Nordic APIs. Uh, thanks for being a part of this and we'll get it down to Austin one day again. Fantastic. Uh, I just love your philosophy of thinking like a bad guy. You just have such a fun approach to it too and attacking it with all these creative different ways. Uh, and I, I believe that using the people who you trust to attack the system is brilliant and necessary is something all organizations should be considering. I love the Thank idea you. of like feeding a bank of 500 megabyte file just to see what the hell happens. <laughs> yeah, and one of, the, one of the powerful things that comes along with that is that when external attackers come at us, it's total black box testing. They don't understand the test and the suites, uh, the test suites and everything and the enforcement that we have. Insiders do, which means that some insiders are going to stick to the happy path. They're going to stick to the path that they know is well tested, but others are going to say, wait a minute, I know there's a gap here. Let's find it. Let's show it. Let's see what happens. And I think that's a great place to be. Well, yeah, since internal folks can stick to that path that they know, uh, would you say that they're blinded at times? Oh, absolutely. We, we're all, uh, we are all optimistic, fundamentally. And we all want to make sure, or we all want to think that we, we answered all those questions, that we blocked all those paths. And so sometimes we need to hand it to other people on the team and let them attack and, and mm -hmm. trade back and forth. The thing to remember, though, is that we're not the enemy. So when somebody finds a problem, and somebody will, don't get angry at them. Realize, wait a minute, we found this together. Yeah. Thank you. Now let's fix it before this becomes a catastrophic problem. Yeah. And organizations are going to have their own way for, you know, implementing change and having a, you know, a list of all these different issues um, just that matches their culture, I, I would assume. But yeah, that's interesting and maybe even a little disruptive in an organization to give the keys to someone who's not accustomed with the API design, but who knows that it could really expose things. Um, that's great. Uh, do we have any, any final questions, any, uh, tidbits that any of our panelists would like to uh, speak on before we wrap things up, kind of just bringing the floor open since we haven't really had any uh, Q and A questions from attendees. Yeah. I, I just always laugh a bit when you, when you mentioned the, uh, the short identifier used for API keys or for, for anything essentially uh, OAuth device flow had that, that flaw as well. You had a short user code and what you usually forget then is also, it's not only that it's short, you have the birthday paradox, uh, which means you don't have to try all combinations. You can try a log logarithmically low number 
and be fairly high rate of success to actually go through. Uh, worth looking up when you're using low short numbers or short short strings for, for identifiers. It's like the old DNS spoof attack. I mean, it was the same. You, you sent like a thousand packets and you had a 90% chance or something to, to spoof a DNS. Even though it's 65,000 numbers, you should try to match. Super interesting. Yeah, thank you. And one one interesting thing I saw for the the device grant type specifically is somebody had a thing set up where on the kiosk, you could take out your phone and scan a QR code. And so it made a lot of sense of, well, this thing is right in front of you. What they didn't realize is everything on the kiosk was also on the screen above. And so there's scenarios where you could stand five, 10 feet away. And if you're focused on the screen, you don't see that guy standing behind you who's also scanning your QR code. Yeah. And we, we have to keep these things in mind that these things are going to happen. When we have sense information. Let's make sure that only a very limited number of people can even ac have access to it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Interesting yeah, stuff. Let's throw up Himantru in here for a second. Um, any best practices or ideas on how you at T-Mobile are thinking like a bad guy? Yeah, and I think uh, we we are constantly improving in those areas and uh, thinking to kind of uh, take the adversarial approach that uh, Casey is talking about. Um, and uh, using the libraries, uh, not having to reinvent things, um, coming up with, uh, staying aligned with the standard um, standard specs around authentication authorization. Uh, those are the uh, right things to do. And uh, scope registry is the more methodical approach that I talked about uh, to uh, superpower those things uh, and give it give it the more richer metadata to control API endpoints. So um, welcome anyone to connect with me on uh, doing this in an open source, open source manner. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Thanks for speaking. Um, the same to all of our panelists today. Thank you for sharing your time with us and uh, sharing your expert insights. So let's just wrap things up here. I think we're a little bit over time. So I'll try and be quick. Just some sign off notes as usual. So this has been another Nordic APIs live cast. Hope you found it useful. Um, thank you to our sponsor, Curity. You can find them on Twitter at Curity.io. And you can also follow Nordic APIs there or sign up to our newsletter for biweekly API digests and more event information in the future. So yeah, that's all we have today. Like I said, again, uh, thank you panelists for participating. Um, we usually do a blog wrap up and we'll post this video to YouTube and embed that within the Nordic APIs website coming soon. Uh, we have some design updates for the Nordic APIs website. You know, we're using the time to improve things and hopefully we'll be back hitting the ground running with physical events in the future. So thank you for joining us today. We'll stay tuned for more later. Bye.